There are very few artifacts shrouded in more legends and mythical energy than swords. After all, what is a king or a warrior without a sword? All over the world, each culture had their own way of making these amazing weapons, all in different styles and shapes, and all with a lot of historical importance. Swords consist of a metal blade that varies in length, configuration, and breadth, and they have evolved together with mankind. From a sword that exists, but nobody's allowed to look at, to the deadliest sword in the whole world because it's cursed, here are the 20 most legendary swords that actually exist. Number 20. Guy finding a golden dagger in the mountains with a metal detector. We've all seen people walking on the beach early in the morning before all the tourists come along armed with their metal detectors, hoping to find some jewelry, money, or who knows what. And we also know that they rarely find anything more than cheap jewelry, some coins, and maybe some soda cans. But what if I told you that sometimes, like in this video, they actually find super cool and ancient stuff? Take this guy, for instance. He was doing his routine morning walk with his metal detector and a friend. The first few minutes of the video, nothing really happens. But all of a sudden, the metal detector goes crazy and they both start digging frantically. And what do you know? An awesome golden dagger that looks super old was buried under the sand. I don't know about you, but this dagger looks to me like it could have magic powers, like it belonged to a long-forgotten hero, don't you think? There isn't much data on the internet as to where and when this video was taken. Maybe the two guys wanted to keep things secret so that the authorities wouldn't come and take their dagger from them. Who knows? Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Norimitsu Odashi This is a massively huge sword from Japan. It is so big, in fact, that it's said that it was wielded by a giant. I mean, who else could pick up such a sword, right? It measures 12.37 feet in length, and as far as we know, it was forged in the 15th century AD. It weighs a whopping 31.97 pounds. But these facts are the only ones known about the Norimitsu Odashi. Aside from that, this massive sword is shrouded in mystery. The Japanese are renowned for their outstanding sword-making technology. We've all heard of the deadly katanas in samurai films, haven't we? But actually, there are many different varieties of blades that were produced by the expert swordsmiths in Japan over the centuries, and one of them was the Odachi. Odachi translates as large, great sword and it was sometimes referred to as nodachi, which means field sword. The blade is long, curved, and typically is about 35 to 39 inches long. But some odachi are recorded to have had blades that were as much as 6.56 feet long. It's hard to imagine how the warriors could fight with such immense swords. But as we all know, Japanese warriors were extremely skilled. Some people believe that the odachi would have been extremely cumbersome to use in combat, and therefore it probably was a kind of standard for an army. Just like in other parts of the world, like Europe for instance, they used flags during a battle. Number 18. Napoleon Sword This magnificent sword was carried by Napoleon Bonaparte himself when he was not yet emperor into the Battle of Marengo in northern Italy in June 1800. Bonaparte was launching a surprise attack to push the Austrian army from Italy and secure France's victory. The intricately decorated blade is 32 inches long and has a slight curve, a design that Napoleon drew from the Egyptian campaign. After the Battle of Marengo, he gave the sword to his brother as a wedding present, and it has since been passed down throughout the generations. Yeah, that's right, the sword never actually left the family. It was recently sold at an auction for $6.4 million to an anonymous buyer, but the 200-year-old sword has an estimated value of much less than that, about $1.6 million to be precise. The auction house did not elaborate into the details, but they did say the sword will remain in Napoleon's family, the same ones that had put it up for auction. The auction took place outside one of Napoleon's imperial castles in Fontainebleau, which is a town southeast of Paris. Number 17. Sword of Gojin This ancient sword sat untouched in a waterlogged tomb for 2,500 years. What's crazy is that it remained relatively untarnished and also surprisingly sharp. 
It was found in 1965 when an archaeological team discovered several ancient tombs along one of the aqueducts of the Zhang River Reservoir in Jingzhou, China. They discovered north of 2,000 artifacts, but the Sword of Gojin is by far the most mysterious and impressive. The sword was found lying next to a human skeleton inside a water-damaged casket. The tomb had been soaked for over 20 centuries, but it looked almost as good as new. How could that be? Scientists believe that the scabbard, which has a black lacquer finish, provided the sword with an almost airtight fit. Thanks to that, and also the chemical composition of the magnificent artifact, this amazing blade remained almost like if it was stopped in time. When they found it, they were able to easily cut through 20 pieces of hard paper with it. Now that is really impressive. The Sword of Gojian measures 22 inches in length with a 3.3 inch hilt, and the intricate and exquisite forged blade was made of mainly copper and some tin on the edges to harden the blade and keep it nice and sharp. The guard is inlaid with blue crystals and turquoise. Number 16. The Seven-Branched Sword This incredible sword might look like a metal cactus, but it is, in fact, a historical artifact loaded with power and mythical importance. It's believed to be a sort of continental manufacture, although it was a present from the King Bekya that was granted upon a Yamato ruler. The sword was mentioned in the Nihon Soki in the 52nd year of the reign of the powerful and semi-mythical empress, Jingu. Jingu was a legendary empress who ruled as a regent of Japan after her husband's death in 200 AD. She's still considered a semi-legendary figure because it is said that she established Japanese hegemony over Korea. The seven-branched sword has an inscription on its side that has helped modern historians understand the relationship between the kingdoms of the Korean peninsula and Japan in that period of time. This sword was probably not used in battle because of its peculiar shape. It was most likely used for ceremonial purposes only. The sword gets its its name due to the three branch-like protrusions that extend on each side of the main body. Together with the tip of the central blade, they make up seven branches. The sword measures two and a half feet in length, and it was made out of forged iron. Number 15. The Dufikar Scimitar also known as Du El Fikar, this sword is usually historically depicted as a scissor-like, double-bladed artifact on Muslim flags. They used to function as talismans. This one in particular belonged to Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was a cousin, son-in-law, and companion of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. Ali ruled as the fourth rightly guided caliph from the year 656 until his assassination in 661. The meaning of the sword is uncertain to this day. The word du means master or possessor, and the meaning of fakar could be interpreted as splitter or differentiation. In the Islamic theological writings, the sword's name is often associated with the stars of the belt of Orion, which consequently emphasizes the celestial provenance of the sword. It also makes reference to the literal vertebrae of the spine, which yields a very interesting interpretation in the sense of the severer of the vertebrae, or the spine splitter. But newer theories point to the fact that the name of this mythological sword could simply just come from the double-edged sword, and also maybe makes a reference to the metaphorical sword discerning between right and wrong. Number 14. Joyeuse in French, joyeuse means joyous, joyful. In medieval legend, this sword was wielded by none other than Charlemagne himself. It was his personal weapon. The joyeuse was used in French royal coronations as early as the 13th century. Even Louis XVI was painted holding the sword once he was king of France. The joyeuse is now kept at the Louvre Museum. With its gilt made out of pure gold and the precious gems in the head of its lance, this is not only a very valuable historical artifact, but also one of the most important relics of France's history. But Charlemagne was not only an important figure for France, but the entirety of Europe as well. Also known as Charles the Great, he was King of the Franks from 768, King of the Lombards from 774, and Emperor of the Romans from 800. During the early Middle Ages, Charles the Great managed to unite the vast majority of Western and Central Europe under his rule. He made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem wielding this sword, and he also used it to behead the Saracen commander, Corsable. Charlemagne was never seen without his sword. He even used it to knight his comrade, Ogier the Dane. But one day, he unfortunately lost it in battle. But thankfully, it was retrieved by one of his knights. And to thank him, he gave him a city named Joyeuse. The city of Joyeuse still has the same name today, and it's located in the French region of Ardèche. Number 13. Kurtana 
The Sword of Mercy This is one of the three original swords used for the coronation of British monarchs. Five swords are in use today for the same purpose. Curtano was first used in 1236 for the coronation of Eleanor of Provence, who was the wife and queen of Henry III, and it's been used for every single coronation since. Such an ancient sword is incredibly rare nowadays, especially considering that it managed to survive the reign of Oliver Cornwell, who happened to order all ancient artifacts for their metal and gold. Cortana's tip is now blunt and squared, which is believed to represent mercy. But the word is, the sword belonged to the legendary Tristan, a hero from Arthurian legend, and he was apparently responsible for the broken tip, which was once pointed. The blade of the sword is 31.75 inches long and 1 inch wide. It was made out of steel with an inlay of copper and a wire-bound grip. Researchers today believe that Cortana is actually much older than the stories tell, as they dated the sword to have been crafted in the 11th century. And so is its scabbard, which is covered in velvet embroidered with a beautiful gold thread. Number 12. Tomoyuki Yamashita's Sword on the 2nd of September 1945, General Tomoyuki Yamashita of Imperial Japan, also known as the Tiger of Malaya, surrendered his forces to the British Lieutenant General Arthur Percival in the Philippines. He did so by handing over his samurai sword to the victorious allies. That sword is the one you're looking at right now. But only a few years prior to that, it was actually Percival that was doing the surrendering. He had to surrender the forces under his command to Yamashita himself on the 15th of February 1942 in Singapore. And that day, Yamashita was also carrying this same sword with him. In fact, United Kingdom Prime Minister Winston Churchill called the fall of Singapore the worst disaster and the largest capitulation of British history. Since then, Yamashita's sword has been on display in museums all over the world, and it remains to this day one of the star artifacts to be showcased at every major World War II exhibition. It was also displayed at the National Museum of Singapore to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the fall of Singapore. The sword was made between 1640 and 1680, and it is a magnificent samurai sword that is still in a remarkably pristine condition even though it has seen many a war in its day. Number 11. William Wallace's Sword this is an antique two-handed sword that is believed to have belonged to William Wallace, who lived from 1270 to 1305. William was a Scottish knight who led the resistance to the English occupation of Scotland during the Wars of Scottish Independence. Historians think that William actually used this sword at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in 1297, and also at the Battle of Falkirk in 1298. If you've seen the movie Braveheart, you'll know the amazing story of William Wallace. He was an incredibly brave and skilled warrior who spent his entire life fighting for the freedom of his people. Before being hanged, disemboweled, drawn, and quartered, William's last words were, it is well, I die hard, but I am not afraid to go. As you can see, he was valiant and fearless until his last breath. His sword is actually huge. It measures 1.63 meters in length and weighs almost 3 kilos. Only an incredibly strong warrior could have wielded it in battle. This also suggests that William probably was incredibly tall for the time. Scientists believe he must have been at least 6 feet 7 inches tall. Considering that in 13th century Scotland, the average height for men was only 5 feet, he must have towered above his followers like a beacon of strength. Number 10. Durandal also known as Durandart, it is the famous sword of Roland, the Frankish knight who valiantly died at the Battle of Ranchevaux Pass on the 15th of August 788 against the attack of the Basques. The many accounts of the battle and the fate of the Durandal sword are plagued with mythical stories and legends. Word is, the legendary hero, Bernardo del Carpio, was the one who killed Roland and took his sword. Roland was later buried with Durandal in a cave near the monastery of Santa Maria la Real in Aguilar del Campo. But then, Charles I took it when he visited the tomb in July 1522. But legend also has it that Roland himself embedded Durandart in the walls of a medieval monastery in the city of Rocamadour in southwest France. He did this so that his beloved Durandal wouldn't fall into the hands of his enemies. And there it stayed for nine centuries. The monks themselves secured the sword to the wall with a chain. But it was not complete. A piece of the sword was missing, and to this day, nobody knows where that missing piece is. In 2011, the town council removed the sword from the monastery's wall, and today it's on display at the Royal Armory of Madrid. Number 9. 
Hanjo Masamune. Also known as Goro Nyoto Masamune, he was a priest and medieval Japanese blacksmith who's widely recognized as Japan's greatest swordsmith to have ever lived. Masamune made swords and daggers. However, many of his tachi were made into katana by cutting the tang later on in history. For this reason, the only creations that still exist of him are actually katana and tanto. It's unclear when exactly Masamune lived, but it's generally agreed that he made most of his work between 1288 and 1328. Historians think that the master lived in Sagami province, where he was trained by swordsmiths from all over Japan. His name carries such importance that still today, there is an award for swordsmiths called the Masamune Prize, and it's awarded at the Japanese sword making competition. If you are a fanatic of katana, then you will know that most bladesmiths signed their work by etching their names into the metal of the hilt. But Masamune had a reluctance to sign his blades, which has made it incredibly difficult to identify them today. But as you might have guessed, his swords don't really need identification for experts to know that he made them. In a way, the outstanding and almost legendary quality of his work is all the signature needed to recognize his blades. Number 8. The Sword in the Stone, The Legend of St. Galgano A sword handle can be seen protruding from a stone at the Rotonda at Montesieppi near the ruins of the Abbey of St. Galgano, Italy, and it's believed to be the handle of the Sword of St. Galgano. That sword has been considered a fake for centuries, but recently, scientists have examined the composition of the metal and they have confirmed that the metal and the style of the sword is compatible with the era of the legend of St. Galgano. Ground penetrating radar has also revealed that under the sword there is a cavity. It measures about 2 meters by 1 meter, which is the perfect size for a burial recess, and it possibly contains the knight's body. The sword in the stone is believed to be the inspiration for the medieval legend about King Arthur and how he pulled a sword from the stone which proved he was the rightful king. Galgano, on the other hand, became a knight and trained in the art of war with the best teachers, but he was said to be very arrogant and led the life of a thug. All until Archangel Michael appeared before him and showed him the way of salvation and of God. After that, he was canonized and became a legend throughout Europe. Number 7. Kusanagi no Surugi this is a legendary Japanese sword and also one of the three imperial regalia of Japan. Kusanagi no Surugi was actually originally called Ame no Murakumo no Surugi, which means Heavenly Sword of Gathering Clouds. The sword's modern and more popular name translates to Grass Cutting Sword. In Japanese folklore, Kusanagi no Surugi represents the virtue of valor and it is one of the most important historical artifacts for Japanese people and culture. So much so, nobody is allowed to see it and it's believed to have a divine origin in Shinto tradition, so the exact shape and condition of the sword hasn't really been confirmed. We have to be satisfied by only our imagination with this one. According to the legend, the god called Susanu encountered a grieving family that was being terrorized by the fearsome Yamada no Orochi, an eight-headed serpent who had already eaten seven of the eight daughters. The monster was coming for the eighth daughter that same day, but Susano thought of a plan to defeat the serpent. Once he defeated the creature, in one of its tails there was a magnificent sword. It was Kusanagi no Surugi. Susano married the eighth daughter and gave the sword to a goddess he had an issue to settle with. The most recent appearance of the Kusanagi no Surugi was in 2019 when Emperor Naruhito ascended to the throne, but the sword was shrouded in packages. Number 6. The Isle of Man's Sword of State this sword is reputed to have belonged to Olaf II. He was King of Man and the Isles. His brother was leading a rebellion which culminated in the Battle of Tinwald Hill in St. John's. In that battle, his brother, as well as his supporters, were all slaughtered. And King Olaf used this sword as a symbol of the fact that he had defeated the rebellion and defended his right to the throne. Anyone who would try to challenge that would have to meet with his mighty sword. Today, the Isle of Man sword depicts the Manx national symbol and the three legs of Man. Man. It is a hugely important artifact to the Isle of Man, and it embodies the fact that Tinwald is the oldest continuous parliament in the entire world. The Sword of State can be seen on a tour of the Tinwald buildings held quite regularly. Number 5. Sterbietz, the Sword of Polish Kings 
This was the sword used in crowning ceremonies of almost all the kings of Poland from 1320 to 1764. Today, Sterbietz is currently on display at the treasure vault of the Royal Wawel Castle in Krakow. It is, in fact, the only preserved piece of medieval Polish crown jewels. This sword is particularly enchanting because it's characterized by its hilt, which is decorated with magical formulas, Christian symbols, and delicate floral patterns. Its name derives from the Polish word sterba, meaning a gap, notch, or a chip. But the blade of the Sterbietz is straight and smooth, so it's not clear why the sword got its name. Legend has it, Sterbietz once belonged to King Boleslaus the Brave, who, during his capture of Kiev in 1018, hit his sword against the Golden Gate, which is now in Ukraine. And the sword got a notch that way. What we know for sure about Sterbietz is that it was first used as a coronation sword by Vladislaus the Elbow High in 1320. During the lootings made by the Prussian troops in 1795, the sword changed hands several times until it was purchased for the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg in 1884. But in 1928, the Soviet Union returned it to Poland. Although during World War II, Sterbietz was evacuated to Canada for its protection, and it was only returned to Krakow in 1959. During the 20th century, Sterbietz was adopted as a symbol by Polish nationalists and far-right movements. Number 4. Tizona, the Sword of El Cid Also known as Tizen, Tizona is the name of one of the two swords wielded by Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar El Cid. His other sword was called Colada. Rodrigo Diaz was born in Vivar, a small town only 7 kilometers from the city of Burgos, Spain, in the year 1043. He came from a lineage of noble knights of the Castilian court and also Castilian juries. He incarnated the perfect prototype of the Castilian knight with all the virtues that the title entails. He was strong, loyal, just, brave, sensible, temperate, resourceful, and a tireless warrior, but he was also an educated gentleman. His own father died when he was only 15 years old, so Rodrigo grew up in the court of Fernando I with the king's son, Prince Sancho. The two boys were like brothers, and he became the prince's right hand, fighting next to him in the battles of Zaragoza, Coimbra, and Zamora. At the young age of 23, he obtained the title of Campeador after he managed to defeat the second lieutenant of the reign of Navarra in a personal duel. And only one year later, when he was 24, he started to be known as Seed or Mio Seed, which is an utmost expression of admiration. It actually means boss or sir in Arabic. Number 3. Sugari no Ontachi This is a sword that represents the royal regalia of Japan, so much so that it can only be taken out when a new emperor ascends to the throne. Any other day, the Sugari no Ontache is held at the Issei Shrine in the Mia Prefecture. During a coronation, the sword and a feather from a crested ibis are used in the ceremony. There are a few swords in use for this same purpose in Japan, and the last time the Sugari no Ontache was used for ceremonial purposes was in 1995. There's one problem, though. The Crested Ibis has an endangered status now, and so this ceremony will be impossible to do at some point in the future. For this reason, a stock of feathers from the bird was gathered so that they'll have enough until the year 2013. This sword was introduced by Empress Jito, who was the 41st monarch of Japan and the third of eight women who have ever taken the role of Empress Regnant. She was born on 645 AD, and her reign spanned the years from 686 through 697. Number 2. The Curved Saber of San Martin This is the historic weapon used by José de San Martín. He actually acquired the saber during his stay in London, where he lived and studied for a while before embarking for South America and starting the Liberation Wars from the Spanish Crown. He would later on arm his Granaderos cavalry with similar sabers because he deemed them ideal for cavalry charges. San Martín was a famous Argentinian general, and he is still today regarded as a national hero. He was the primary leader of the southern and central parts of South America's successful and difficult struggle for independence from the Spanish Empire. He was born in Yapeu Corrientes, which would be modern-day Argentina. He left the Viceroyalty of the Rio de la Plata at only seven years old to go study in Malaga, Spain. In 1808, after being involved in the Peninsula War against France, San Martin managed to contact South American supporters of independence from Spain in London. A few years later, he set sail for Buenos Aires to offer his services to the United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata. Number 1. The Cursed Muramasa As you may have already guessed, swords are an incredibly important part of Japan's history, and this segment is about the story of a particular swordsmith and his cursed swords called Muramasa's Blades. Sengo Muramasa was born before 1501. 
He was a swordsmith who founded the Muramasa Sword Making School in Japan. He was described as being completely mad and prone to outbursts of violence, and some people believe that these destructive and harmful qualities were passed by the master into the blades he forged. They also believed that the blades had the power to possess their wielders, turning them into insane, bloodthirsty, and deadly warriors. Legend has it, when a Muramasa sword is pulled from its scabbard, it must draw blood before it can be put back, so much so that the wearer even has to injure himself to appease the blade, and sometimes even kill himself. So you can see why Muramasa's swords are deemed the most deadly in the world. Not only are they perfect weapons, they also have the ability to command violence from people. Scary, huh? As you can see, swords have a very crucial and important role in human history and evolution. Even if we don't use them as weapons anymore due to the invention of firearms, swords are still very highly regarded and shrouded in historical meaning and even legendary energy. Of all the amazing swords from this video, which one is your favorite? Tell us about it. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time!